Here we go. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Due to the COVID-19 health emergency, and in order for the Board of Education to conduct its business, this board meeting is being held via video conference and streamed live on YouTube on the district website at www.ebnet.org. In addition, members of the public may provide comment at this meeting through Zoom by entering the URL, meeting ID, and password you see before you on the screen. Upon joining the meeting, your participation will be muted to ensure there is no disruption to the business being conducted by the Board of Education. Would the secretary please call the roll? Mr. Carangelo. Here. Mrs. Chu. Here. Mr. Sismar. Here. Mrs. Guast. Here. Mr. Hong. Here. Mrs. Lax. Here. Mrs. Reese. Here. Mr. Winston. Here. President Becker. Here, we have a quorum. Please rise to salute the flag. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States of America, of America and, and to, to the republic for which it stands, which it stands one nation, nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, and justice, justice for all. The New Jersey Open Public Meeting Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advanced notice of and to attend the meetings of public bodies at which any business affecting their interests is discussed. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the East Brunswick Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be published at the Board of Education offices. Also, written notice was provided to the Sentinel, the Newark Star-Ledger, the Home News and Tribune, and the Municipal Clerk of East Brunswick. All Board of Education meetings, with the exception of executive, executive session discussions, are videotaped for later broadcast, and individuals who speak at the Board's public meeting should be aware of these videotaping rules. Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll start off with the superintendent's report. Thank you, President Becker. Good evening, everyone. Yesterday, the district ran a COVID vaccination clinic at Hammersholt Middle School under the direction of Deborah Millar. Director of Community Outreach and Engagement for Penn Medicine Princeton Health. Together, we successfully administered the first dose of the vaccination to over 80 district employees and 50 East Brunswick residents in under three hours. We are grateful to the team of East Brunswick nurses, SSOs, custodians, all who provided logistical support ensuring a successful clinic. Our second dose clinic for those individuals takes place on May 5th. I also want to say something that something of this magnitude was not achievable without the terrific support I enjoy. I want to give thanks to Danielle Ruggiero, Director of Human Resources, and her HR coordinator, Stephanie Podobicki, as well as my secretary, Janet Angeline, and my executive assistant, Karen Mandler. They were on site with me greeting, managing, coordinating, and finally soliciting replacements for anyone who didn't keep their assigned appointment. This event was formalized in only a few days and every available va vaccine was administered. And I'm so proud of these ladies. They never hesitate to be on the front lines of anything initiated from my office. And no one could have ever forecasted that we would be in the vaccination business. But yesterday we were, and these ladies along with all those from Penn Medicine did it with EB excellence. We were notified this week that the New Jersey Department of Education, or by the New Jersey Department of Education, that the New Jersey Student Learning Assessment, also known as the NJSLA, will not be administered this year. East Brunswick Public Schools will use alternate assessment measures to comply with NJDOE's requirements. So that's good news for us because the management of administering that assessment for both our in person and our virtual learners was going to be a massive undertaking in terms of resources, manpower, and safety. The Churchill Junior High School Drama Club is having a virtual spring performance entitled, Whose Kid Is It Anyway? This comedy improv show features songs, skits, games, and tons of laughter. It is a family-friendly content that everyone will enjoy. Performances will stream April 15th through April 18th at 7 p.m. And tickets are available for $7.50 and can be purchased at cjhs.booktix, that's B-O-O-K-T-I-X, 
www.elijahstromas.com. And all proceeds are being donated to Elijah's Promise of New Brunswick, a very worthy cause. Third quarter report cards can be viewed online through Parent Access on Friday, April 23rd. Hard copies will be made available at the request of anyone without internet access. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Valeski. Now I believe that you have a presentation for us. We do. Um, we have, uh, Mr. Giuliano and I have a facilities presentation. And um, so if you will, um, I'll do the introduction and um, if you'd like, we'll go ahead and get started. The pandemic interrupted our state of the district address that I normally deliver to our community uh, each May before the conclusion of the school year. And tonight's presentation entitled Building Our Success is an abbreviated version of some of the elements I would have presented to the community and our district's efforts to remain transparent about planning for critical and time sensitive projects that are focused on improving every student's experience at East Brunswick Public Schools. Additionally, tonight, we are going to address the additional state aid we received this year because it too is time sensitive. We will explain how much discretionary money we actually received and how that funding is allocated to a variety of operational expenses this year. Secondly, we will also talk about our elementary class size growth and elementary classroom capacities. We revised our recommended facilities approach to address the immediate, intermediate, and longer term problems we need to solve. We concentrated on layering sequential facility solutions in a timely and methodical way that affords the highest impact for every student's educational quality and experience. These solutions need to be implemented within a reasonable time frame while still maintaining a strong focus on efficiency and cost containment. Tonight's facilities portion of the presentation is about what we need to do, how we are planning to do it, and when the community can expect for it to be done. And this is actually surrounded by three distinct priorities. One is to build sustainable elementary classroom capacity in all, in all elementary schools, focus on equity across elementary schools, and contain costs to minimize the tax impact burden on township residents. And so just to provide a perspective, on March 18th, 2020, when we closed our schools because of COVID-19, we immediately re-envisioned what instruction could look like and what it would need to be because we didn't have a choice. We were motivated by external circumstances we could not control. Our success was evident because we had invested years of thoughtful planning and preparedness into how we would and could virtualize teaching and learning. So in many ways, that scenario is about to replay itself. We know the migration of families to East Brunswick is real. Resales of existing East Brunswick properties are bringing more families with school-aged children. We know they are coming for our schools. And unfortunately, the window for planning and preparing for our anticipated increase in student enrollment, especially at the elementary level, is quickly shrinking. It has been over a year since the beginning of the pandemic and virtualization of academics, health and safety in our schools and now vaccinations have been our priorities, but we have never lost ground in our facilities planning that began many years ago. So taking you back to one year ago, we were about to implement a board approved plan to install temporary classroom units, also known as TCUs, at Lawrence Dorfer and Irwin Elementary Schools to address elementary classroom capacities and enrollment growth projections from a demographic study that was presented to the Board of Education in July of 2019. Tonight's presentation represents the culmination of our past year of replanning involving six essential but negotiable elements. First is space. How much of it do we need? Second is placement. Where do we need that space and other facility features? Third is integration. 
How does this plan that we are presenting tonight fit into our existing facility structure and future facility needs? Then communication, that is what tonight is about. And many of you have gotten to know me, um, but you probably recognize my voice more than my face. That is part of our communication. This Board of Education is committed to being transparent and I'm simply the mechanism that gets to deliver the messages to our community. But that communication about our facilities planning is so important. It's important for every community member. It's also intended to solidify the trust and partnership we have and continue to build among the schools, the township, and of course, our greater community. We have to worry about the environment that our teaching and learning will occur in and even athletic spaces. How will they support our students' real world preparedness? How will our facilities support daily occupancy? And something we didn't think about a year ago, but what post pandemic facility issues will we need to address with any temporary or future facilities? And finally, security, something that this district has worked very hard at. We're very proud of the security force that we've created but what security design opportunities present themselves with any new facility or newly added additions to existing facilities? So to add more color to each of these overviews that I've opened with, I'm going to turn over to Mr. Giuliano who has a presentation aligned with this. Thank you, Dr. Valeski. Firstly, I wanted to address uh, part of what you mentioned with regard to uh, state school aid. Uh, this is an excerpt of information that I had presented during the tentative budget adoption. So there are selection, selected um, aspects that I think are important uh, for the community to understand. This first slide represents the uh, history of state aid going back to fiscal 2009. But of particular focus is fiscal 2021. And you see that there are two numbers identified there. Uh, firstly, when we adopted a final budget, that budget was adopted with the states having, state having notified the district that we would be receiving $22.2 million in state aid. Everything was in place. We were moving forward with that budget implementation. However, due to the pandemic and subsequent to implementing the final budget, the state reduced the state aid levels to $20,500,000. In order to continue with the plan, we had to bridge the gap of that lost revenue. The budget was already struck, everything was in motion. And so uh, while there's been discussion with regard to the increase in state aid, what's been publicized has been that increase in state aid from the 20.5 million up to next year's 25.8 million. But it's important to note that while we had to bridge that gap in the current year, we had continuing costs that were, would carry forward and could not be eliminated. So what comprises uh, those amounts with regard to state aid? So we had a custodial and transportation savings from the COVID uh, closures that amounted to $940,000. We had enterprise revenue that we were able to tap into retained earnings of approximately $790,000. Those two components alone were one-time impacts. We had those sources of revenue once. They would not repeat themselves. Now, looking forward, collective bargaining and contractual based salary commitments, that amounts to approximately $2.59 million. Our projected net health benefit cost, approximately $200,000.
Transportation services will increase approximately $340,000. Facilities maintenance, $560,000. Charter schools it will increase by $420,000. And insurance will increase by approximately $100,000. Those budgetary impacts alone are $5.94 million. We can't talk about state aid and those cost effects without reminding the community of the impact that the charter school has had upon the district's budget. You see, historically, where we've come since 2009 when our levels were at under $10,000 to now where we are budgeting for next year, $3.6 million. That's a substantial portion of the district budget that comes almost entirely out of the base and is an amount that we are required to budget and pay out to mostly to uh, the charter school in town. So with that, I hope that provides a little color with regard to state aid. Let me move into the facilities discussion. I'm having a minor technical difficulty here, so just bear with me, please. There we go. So build, building our success. Let's begin with reviewing our enrollment for pre-K to five, historical and projected. This is precisely out of the uh, demographer's report that was presented in July of 2020, uh, 2019. So what we have here are the actual enrollments from 2009-10, through 2018-19. You see that uh, the high point was back in 2009-10. We had a slight decrease over a number of years and then starting to move back up in our enrollment. Projections showing that our enrollment would continue to steadily rise from 2019-20 on through 2023-24 to a high of 3,935 students. And this is strictly at the elementary level. The projected enrollment increase would be 372 students when we look at the high point of 2009-10 to just next year in the 2022-23 school year. When we look another year out, that projected enrollment increases 411 students from 2009-10 to the 2023 school year. This is the equivalent of one entire elementary school. So what are the issues and the considerations that we've had to deal with and address in our planning. Firstly, we currently have no available classrooms at the elementary schools. We have limitations on meeting additional special needs requirements. We have no space for uh, adding additional self-contained classrooms or spaces for supports. Our art classrooms are now relegated out to a cart in some instances and music classrooms no longer are available in some cases. We need to address school security with any plan that we put in place. We looked at expansions to existing elementary school buildings and how that would impact uh, the site configurations because not all of our elementary sites would be able to support additional um, classroom spaces being added. In addition, the impact to neighborhood traffic is a key issue. By adding uh, space 
onto each of the elementary schools. We're bringing additional traffic into that community and how would that then adversely affect the community? Of course, we want to minimize the fiscal impact and come up with a plan that would uh, actually be the best cost-effective plan. And the durability of any expansions, meaning that anything that we do would need to last a long time. We don't want a Band-Aid approach. We want something that's going to last, be durable, and address the needs for an extended period of time into the future. So as we look at our school structure, our elementary schools are K to five, Hammersold is six to seven, Churchill grades eight through nine, and the high school grades 10 through 12. A revised school structure would enable us to create space at the elementary schools by transforming the elementary schools into a K to four grade structure. The fifth grade would move to Hammerschold, making that a grade five, six structure. At Churchill, we would move the seventh grade up and that would be a three grade level school with seven, eight, and nine. And the high school would remain at a 10, 12 configuration. How would that look? This is a architect's rendering of the addition of 32 temporary classroom units at Churchill Junior High School. That would be behind the North Annex, configured in such a way that it provides direct access to and from the North Annex. And if we uh, drill down into what those temporary classroom units and to the configuration of those, here we can see that those units would be configured in such a way that we would have an entire interior corridor providing access by students and staff on the interior of a building. There would be no travel outside the building except for those instances where students and staff travel from the TCUs into the main building and vice versa. In order to address the security aspects of that, certainly we would be adding uh, security and reallocating security personnel to uh, those locations to help ensure uh, the safety of our uh, students and staff. These units are also um, self-contained in that they provide for uh, restroom facilities right within the units. So at the lower part of that upside down U configuration uh, are uh, boys and girls restrooms on either leg. And to address what they might look like, these are some examples of today's modern TCUs. You can see that they're indistinguishable from what would be in a brand new building. So as we go back to the issues and the considerations, we addressed through this plan, the availability of classrooms, addressed the special needs uh, requirements, art and music, we address school security, we limit impact to neighborhood traffic, we minimize the fiscal impact where we would be uh, focusing our work at one location and not affecting multiple elementary schools. This is a durable and lasting solution. And with regard to uh, those other two items in terms of the expansion to existing elementary schools and the limitations to the site configurations at those schools, those issues go away. So what would need to occur? During the month of April and perhaps into May, we would need plan approval from the board. In the period of July through September, 
applications would need to be submitted to the Department of Education for temporary classroom units. Concurrently from July and then into December, and these again are rough estimates of timelines, we would have to prepare TCU specifications and award a contract. By June of 2022, the goal is to have the TCUs installed at Churchill. And by September of 2022, the TCUs would be occupied and the revised grade configuration would be in place. And that concludes the presentation on building our success. Dr. Valeski, you're muted. Dr. Valeski. Sorry. So, President, thank you, Mr. Giuliano. So, President Becker, and I apologize. It, I've probably been one of the people that's watched and smiled every time somebody's muted themselves and said, oops, I'm muted. So, I, I'm doing it too. Um, so, did you want to open up for any questions or were there questions from the board? Took the words right out of my mouth. Um, is there anybody who has any questions or comments? I, I actually had um, a question, uh, just a clarification, going back to um, what you said at the very beginning of the presentation, Bernie, um, when you talked about a one-time offset to bridge the gap for funds, um, that resulted when the state cut our budget in June, I think it was, after it had been approved, or May? It actually, uh, came, the budget was uh, finalized in May. in May. Then the state uh, provided us with additional information, I believe it was in July. So just trying to do the numbers, because I think that um, it, you were right when you said that um, people are probably curious. So if there was, almost an additional or an increase of 5 million. That 5 million really isn't an additional $5 million in funds because of that chart you laid out, which included the offset that we needed to make up the gap last year, that that was a one-time offset. So going forward, any other budget could not include those funds as revenue and also the other items you listed that were all going up. And I think that brought us to 5.4, if I'm going remembering by your slide. 5.94 million, nearly $6 million. Right, so I just, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear um, and uh, able to be understood user-friendly, if you will. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we work so closely with these things um, we might use terminology that isn't as familiar to everyone, but I think that uh, the point, Bernie, again, um, is that it was not really a $5 million increase, if you will. Right. Um, I mean, we can look at this in a couple of ways. And, you know, if we look at it from the point of uh, originally starting out with a state aid level of uh, $22.2 million for the current year, um, we were cut at roughly $1.6 million, $1.7 million, somewhere in there, uh, after the budget was struck. That, that differential was made up by those one-time revenue sources, the savings from custodial and transportation, the, um, uh, the um, retained earnings from our enterprise operations. Uh, so either way that we look at where we are, those funds are accounted for. Uh, we did not have, um, you know, uh, additional funds that, that would have um, allowed us to do anything but balance the budget. Um, had we not received the increase in state aid, we'd actually be looking at making substantive reductions uh, in the budget. And for that kind of differential, we'd be looking at staff. There's no question about it. 
And um, the second item uh, that you mentioned, the what we were able to pull out of the enterprise fund primarily for um, JM Pack rentals, uh, other facility rentals, fields, our other our gyms, our indoor gyms, et cetera, that that are basically every building is used um, seven days a week. Um, would could you speak for a minute about the impact that the pandemic has had on that revenue? Absolutely. So uh, whether it's the um, community programs enterprise or facility use, and the major part of our revenue and facility use comes from the Performing Arts Center at Hammersold, um, Hammersold Middle School. Um, during the period of the pandemic, uh, those functions for community programs has, have been extremely limited in that uh, the only services that could be provided are virtual services. Um, and with regard to facilities use, that has been completely non-existent. So during uh, this current school year, we've actually, and, and part of last year, we have been functioning uh, by uh, essentially dipping into uh, those reserves to keep those operations going as much as possible, uh, paying for um, the uh, cost of those operations, uh, even though the operations were not fully uh, in place. And um, because we were not generating revenues, we've essentially almost exhausted the availability of the reserve. So um, we're going to have to take some time moving forward to rebuild. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else, any comments, questions? I'm not seeing anybody's hand. Oh, I see a hand. Uh, Jeff, then Lee Wu. Um, Bernie, Bernie or Victor, talk to me uh, from the parents' perspective of how this transition would would be for uh, for a student, say, in third or fourth grade, uh, say third grade for that matter. So would this change in this time frame happen to the uh, to the point where? happen right away? Is there a transitionary phase that they'll go through? Is there a grandfathering of sorts? Or would simply fifth grade no longer be uh, in, in the future for that third or fourth grader at the elementary school um, that they go to currently? Yeah. Um, go, Bernie, I'll, I'll, let me go and I'll let you follow up. Um, Mr. Winston, you know, what we would do is we would take a look at our capacity at that time. We would want to make this a soft approach in terms of transition of grades. Um, and by doing that, uh, if we had the availability and parents were, you know, felt passionate about maintaining that fifth grade presence at an elementary school, and we were able to do that, that's something we would certainly consider. There may be parents who want to have their children make the transition, uh, if the board approved this plan, to go on up to Hammershold. Um, but I believe we have the ability, uh, since we're talking about, um, you know, a year from now, more than we're September of 22. Uh, so we've got about 14, 15 months here of real, real planning. Uh, but at that time, we would have the availability to, to do a softer rollout, I believe. Right. Did you yeah. want to follow on that? No, not at this time. Okay. All right. And then, and just to follow up to that then, uh, and I'm sure this has been considered, what, what have you found out either data driven uh, or independently on, um, you know, so, lack of a better word, psychological impact. Uh, now the new combination of, of ages, is there perhaps a benefit buried in here that makes more sense from element, uh, the elementary being reduced down to the fourth grade? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I know it's an intangible but is there anything around that that you could speak to? Yeah, there's there, there's a lot of science on on a lot of fronts about the groupings of students. Um, there have been, uh, you know, historically a lot of models where where middle school uh, was built around a six, seven, eight grade configuration. A lot of districts adopted that model for a number of years, uh, but there is such a disparity between the the emotional and intellectual growth of a sixth grader versus an eighth grader. And so in the same building, you have two distinctly human beings. I mean, they grow so fast over that three-year period too. So you, you see students who are 
literally, you know, standing over top of other students in, in the same same building. Um, but there there is I, I think there's a benefit to this plan in that one of the things that we've looked at for a number of years is the transition from fifth grade to sixth grade from our elementary schools to Hammersholm. And there, I, I've heard from more parents anecdotally about their own experiences, their children's experiences in moving to Hammersholm and what that transition, what the difficulty in that transition is. There, there certainly is a greater emphasis at Hammersholm about independence and responsibility. And that's reinforced by the administration there. Um, I think there's, by doing the shift and having a five, six configuration at Hammersholm, I think once again, we are able to make a softer transition at that fifth grade year, even though it, it would be at Hammersholm and have fifth, sixth grade, I think are more tightly aligned than, than potentially six, seven are. And so, because in a lot of character or a lot of districts, sixth grade is still considered an elementary grade and not treated as a middle school grade. So there's no exact science. You can look for research that will support either position. But I, but I do think in terms of that transition from ele elementary school to middle school, I think this would have um, some benefits to our students and to their families. Did that, did that answer your question? It, it did. Um, yeah. And, and and I'm curious to see how that unfolds. Now, something, uh, the last thing I want to ask about was in the configuration that you had shown where the TCUs are going to be placed. I do understand they're self-contained units, but I also see a gap between the U uh, configuration and the main facility, which would be housing things like uh, lunch, gym, things like that. So on that, uh, as the premise of this question, uh, one, uh, I, I imagine what would be the transit, what is the physical transition from the building to the main facility? And two, how do you address the security concerns of the position of that unit or the U unit, I'll just call it as one unit, uh, where it is laid out based on how Churchill uh, is configured uh, leading out to, I forget the name, was that Root Street or whatever whatever street that is behind. Uh, right. 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 Yes. Yeah, right. I think. So the, the perimeter of that, um, that structure would be secured by security fencing. So that, that, that is an imperative that has to be contained. Uh, it would not be freestanding out in the middle of the field. But uh, right now the plan would be not to attach physically attach the structure to a building just to have sidewalks out of those, those exits from the back of Churchill on the, the back side of the north side, um, but not, not to bring it up and, and attach it to the building. Bernie, I don't know the exacts on this, but I assume there's going to be a variety of fire code issues and fire marshal approvals yeah. to do this. Yeah, and one of the things that um that has a direct impact in terms of uh, the separation uh, between the two, um, the, the, the main facility and the TCUs is the fact that there is a um, fire access road that right. runs behind the school and that has to be maintained. So we realize this is, this is a, this is not a per. I want to emphasize. This is not a permanent solution. This is a semi-permanent but durable solution. And I want to be completely candid with the community that um, temporary classrooms uh, really start the planning for some kind of a permanent structure to replace them. And but that that be, that allows us the time to thoughtfully plan and begin to think about how we're going to finance uh, such an endeavor. Um, but, it, but it does immediately address our capacity issues in our elementary schools. Uh, and as Mr. Giuliano stated, it, it addressed all of the elements that he put forth in that slide presentation uh, by, by freeing up space uh, at the elementary level and building this out at, um, at Church Hill. Jeff, what, you good? 
Okay. Uh, I have uh, Lee Wu and then Heather. So, so Bernie, uh, thank you very much for the uh, beautiful uh, presentation. When the community uh, understands that this plan will uh, temporarily uh, uh, answer out the uh, classroom and teaching space uh, demand. But uh, if possible, can you talk about the financial uh, impact to the community? Or if this is too early for you to answer this question, you, know, you, you don't have to. But at the end of the day, the community will say, hey, how can those guys get the money to put those TCUs uh, in place? No, I understand that. And um, I, I don't, I, right now I'm working off of estimates and I don't like putting estimates out. Um, I'm hoping that uh, by the next board meeting, I may be able to address that uh, more uh, solidly. So if you can hold off until the next board meeting, I'll be happy to bring that up uh, at that time. Yeah, I'm very happy to hold off. Thank you. Thank you, Lee Wu. Thank you. Heather? Well, thank you for the presentation. It clarifies a lot of reasons why we need to make these changes, obviously, for numbers and to keep our class sizes at the level that we expect, um, which is just better for instruction and better for our students. So that's fantastic. Um, I do like the placement of the TCUs. I was looking at them as uh, Mr. Winston was talking, and I just... I think that the U structure is such a wise idea because I just picture that it's better for security than if we had a longer structure or children entering and exiting from more places. And there seems to just be one point of egress. And from a safety standpoint, that seems to be a much better option. Um, I wanted to ask though about Hammershell, Dr. Valeski, if we're moving the fifth graders up to Hammershell, Mm -hmm. Well, they have the opportunity to have the wider range of electives that were offered at Hammerschild previously to the sixth and seventh grader. Yeah, sixth and seventh graders, um, because there are a lot more electives and the cycle classes that the students there have always been able to have. Or will they still be just keeping with the previous fifth grade curriculum? I think we have the opportunity to re-envision what fifth grade looks like. And I'm going to ask Dr. Boley to weigh in here, too, because... Um, you know, it's, it's not about the grade, it's about the opportunity this presents for us to give our students a better experience. And so while, while the primary focus has been, and, and the driver has been actual classroom capacity, the, the real planning over this last year has been to refine this and say, okay, if we're going to do this, we know we need to do this. There, this, is, this is ultimately not gonna be under our control. We're gonna outgrow our buildings. How can we make that experience for every single student that we have the ability to touch better than it is right now? So Dr. Boley, do you wanna, do you wanna weigh in? Yeah, certainly. So I agree with what you said. And um, I think it's exciting. It's a great opportunity if we do move forward in this direction to um, reimagine what our fifth grade uh, students experiences, um, considering keeping the house model for them. Um, and offering, you know, like you said, Mrs. Guas, the, the cycle opportunities, the elective opportunities, and really bu building out, um, you know, a, a very solid and cohesive educational program for them in that state-of-the-art facility. You know, what's, what's interesting, I just, I just thought of this. Um, a couple of years ago, as we opened school, we had a... Um, a significant event at Frost Elementary School that caused us to close the school the very first day. And we, we all of the bathroom facilities were unable to be used. We, we got all of the students on buses. We took them to Hammershold and they got to spend the rest of the day at Hammershold. They were in the JM pack. And I remember escorting children, especially the male children to the, all the male children to the, to the restroom and, and overseeing that activity. So that was, that was pretty interesting conversation. And I can't tell you the number of fifth graders from Frost who would look around the building and go, I can't wait to be here. So, you know, at fifth grade, they were, 
they were emotionally and socially and intellectually ready to go up to that building to exert their independence. And, and it was fun to watch. They're, they Some of them had probably been in with their older siblings of their family, but being in there by themselves now, that this being the school they were occupying for that day, it was like some of them were like, yeah, if I had the choice, I would just stay right here. So it was kind of interesting. Thank you. I, I just, I like the idea. I'm always in favor of more opportunities and more electives for our students. So I do think it's exciting to be able to offer them possibly the number of cycle classes and electives that we've been able to offer the students at Hammershold in the past. I know as a parent, my own students that went through Hammershold, what they came away from was the cycle classes, made them aware of things that they had talents for or things they enjoyed that they had had no idea about. And both of them said they wished they had known that earlier, that they would have done more of that. So it's definitely a plus for them. And thank you so much. Thank you, Heather. Um, Lori had a question. Yeah, I just had a quick logistical question for the TCUs. So I love that everything is self-contained and the pictures certainly look nicer than the uh, trailers that I remember. My only question is, will there be differences in the passing time? Like one of the problems that we had with Churchill was the ping pong kids that went from one end of this school to the other. So I get that everything is self-contained, but in terms of going for lunch or for gym or for, um, you know, any, any reason they go into the building, will the, how will it impact the kids in terms of how much longer it will take them to get into the building? Do we have to revamp just that grades passing times or? No, Mrs. Lax, this is, this is part of a, of a very stage. We'll have, um, we'll be involving, um, you know, Mr. Hannes and his administrative team uh, to really look at this and, and see what, uh, not only that issue, the issues you, you raised, but any other logistical issues that we would need. And of course, with the addition of this kind of a, a, a grade structure, we would have to have appropriate administrative support and grade level support uh, in that complex as well. Um, but those, those, are, those are achievable. Uh, so we will have to look at the, the structure, how it supports those students uh, and how we can build efficiencies and providing passing time and lunch, all those things. How, how can we do that? Those questions we don't have all the answers to yet, but they are, they are certainly achievable. Thanks, Lori. Uh, is there anybody else whose hand who wants a comment question that I'm not seeing? Okay, um, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Dr. Valeski, um, when can the community uh, expect updates from you and embellish, uh, uh, build further on the details? over the next school year? Are you going to plan maybe some town halls? Yes, so we have, um, as you can imagine, we have a lot more work to do once the board gives us the approval to move forward with this, um, with the TCUs. So um, we, are, we are hopeful that the circumstances will accommodate face-to-face -face presentations or group presentations at one of our facilities with maybe a live stream component so that parents who are un unable to attend or don't feel comfortable attending uh, can still hear what, what's happening. But I envision uh, providing a series of mini state of the district addresses. The one I referred to that I typically would do in May and having a series of those uh, over next school year beginning in September and, and going you know, pretty aggressively through the year, the school year uh, to keep the community informed about what we're doing, um, what it's going to look like, especially for those families who have students who will be impacted. Um, and then, of course, keeping them abreast of the actual activity of, of actually getting TCU set up on site and, and timing and things like that. So, you know, people will see activity. Um, so staying ahead of that and keeping people informed in, in the same transparent way we've been through the COVID crisis. You know, we've We've tried very hard to not, not hide behind anything and be transparent about things that are affecting us in the community. So we would handle this the same way. And of course, the, the key phrase there is, you know, what the climate allows in terms of in-person gatherings for the fall. But 
it would be nice to think if we were able, and we don't know, obviously, but if we were able to have any kind of a traditional in-person back to school night in September and October, it might be a nice thing to have a table set up mm-hmm. with um, renditions of the slide presentation we just saw and somebody from the administration there um, because it's it's kind of bringing it to where the parents will be anyway. So yeah. allowing a, a good forum, you know, again, if if we are able to have the uh, in-person back to school night. Yes, I agree. Okay. Um, seeing no other. Barbara, is that a shadow or your hand or a halo? A halo. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you again. This brings us now to the good of the cause of the public. Members of the public may provide comments at this meeting through Zoom by entering the URL, meeting ID, and password that you see before you on the screen. In order to be recognized, use the chat feature, select the Zoom meeting host, then enter and send your name to the host. You will be recognized to speak when your name is called, and individuals will be invited to speak in the order in which we have received your request. The Board of Education recognizes the value of public comment on educational issues and the importance of allowing members of the public to express themselves on school matters. Participants will be limited to three minutes duration. Is there anyone wishing to address the board tonight, Bernie? There is no one in the queue. Okay, seeing no one in the queue, uh, I close the public portion. Okay, Uh, tonight's agenda, there's one item on the Board of Education uh, agenda. Can I please have a motion for that item? Mrs. Becker, I'm sorry, there are um, three items. Oh yeah, sorry, one, two, three. Not looking at my notes, need to wear my glasses more frequently. Um, um, (laughs) There are items one, two, and three. May I please have a motion? I'd like to combine items one, two, and three. So, yes. Okay, I need to do that again with my glasses on, please. Who so moved? Jeff? Lee Wu. Yes. And Lee Wu second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Stain? Motion carries. Under community programs, can I please have a motion to combine items one through four? So moved, Lori. Moved by Lori. Second. Second. Second by Jeff. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Oppose? Motion carries. Curriculum and instruction. Can I please have a motion for items one through three? So moved. Moved. Moved by Lori. Second by Lee Wu. Is there any discussion? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, I see a lot of discussion. I saw uh, Mark Sismar, Susanna Chu, and Barbara. Uh, with, uh, so we'll start with uh, questions from those three. Mark, <laughs> Susanna, Barbara. Yeah, quick question. On the curriculum minutes, there was five courses, new courses that were proposed. And I see four on the agenda tonight. Was the fifth removed? For, for right now, Mr. Sismar, yes. There were concerns okay. about, yes. Thank you. Uh, Susanna and then Barbara. Um, yes. So I miss the curriculum committee. It's uh, always a great discussion to hear, you know, more detail about the programs being offered. So I was, um, the leadership program was kind of written up differently. It was attached, you know, not with the write-up so of of what type of course is it going to be? So is it an elective full year, part year? So I just wanted to understand that one a little more. Yeah, it will be an elective course. Um, This was brought to the committee um, by Dr. Vanilla. Um, Building Leaders for Life is the name of the the course. And we were just getting approval at the last meeting for the concept of the course. The course still has to be built out. It's grant funded. Um, But the course is uh, a high school leadership class. And, um, you know, once that grant is approved, he's going to go forth and uh, form a little committee and have the actual curriculum written. Okay. So, so it's proposed to be a full year class or, or 
uh, not, or we don't know yet. I believe it'll be a full year class. All right. Oh, but great. It yes. It looks great. Yeah, I was just curious what, what was planned for it. It looks great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Barbara? That was my question. I, I thought it was a great class and I just wanted to hear more about it. Thank you. Jeff, I believe I saw your hand up. No? Is that it? Uh, uh, Ms. Drew had it. That was my question. And uh, it was a good one. So thank you. It's covered. Are there any other questions, discussion? Okay, this is a roll call vote. Will the secretary please call the roll? Mr. Carangelo? Yes. Mrs. Chu? Yes. Mr. Sismar? Yes. Mrs. Guas? Yes. Mr. Hong? Yes. Mrs. Lax? Yes. Mrs. Reese? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. President Becker? Yes, motion carries. On our facilities agenda, there are two items. Can I please have a motion for items one and two? So moved, Jeff. Moved by Jeff, second by Lori. Is there any discussion? Uh, Susanna? What, unmute. Um, uh, yeah, I just had a question about, um, it didn't explain in the addendum it's an increase of, of the three custodians, and I was just curious if that was related to additional cleaning protocols for COVID um, or for some other reason. Uh, it's to uh, supplement where we're unable to uh, fill positions. <laughs> okay, thank you. Was there anyone else? Okay, um, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. I'd like to combine items 1 through 13 on the financial services agenda, but is there any item that anyone would like separated out? Seeing none, I'd like to have a motion for items 1 through 13 on the financial services agenda. So moved, Jeff. Moved by Jeff? Second by Mark. Second by Mark, two. Is there any discussion? Okay, this is a roll call vote. Will the secretary please call the roll? Mr. Carangelo? Yes. Mrs. Chu? Yes. Mr. Sismar? Yes. Mrs. Guas? Yes. Mr. Hong? Yes. Mrs. Lax? Yes. Mrs. Reese? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. President Becker? Yes, motion carries. Moving on to our human resources agenda, can I please have a motion for item one? Move. Move by Lori? Second by Mark two. Is there any discussion? Will the secretary please call the roll? Mr. Carangelo. Yes. Mrs. Chu. Yes. Sismar. Yes. Mrs. Guas. Yes. Mr. Hong. Yes. Mrs. Lax. Yes. Mrs. Reese. Yes. Mr. Winston. Yes. President Becker. Yes, motion carries. We have one item under staff development. Can I please have a motion for that item? So moved. Moved by Lori. Second. Second by Mark Two. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. We have one item on our student services agenda. Can I please have a motion from that item? So moved, Liu. Uh, moved by Lee Wu, second by Lori. Is there any discussion? <coughs> Will the secretary please call the roll? Mr. Carangelo? Yes. Mrs. Chu? Yes. Mr. Sismar? Yes. Mrs. Guas? Yes. Mr. Hong? Yes. Mrs. Lax? Yes. Mrs. Reese? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. President Becker? Yes, motion carries. Moving on to our committee reports, information items, and for the good of the cause to the board. Uh, Lou, our student rep, is not with us tonight. Okay. Um, still recovering from spring break, I guess. Uh, okay. Uh, committee items, information items, for the good of the cause to the board. Anybody have anything? I see Lee Wu's hand. So um, on March 24, uh, the curricular committee had a great meeting. You know, five courses, 
were proposed and four or five were approved. And those four courses was approved by the board tonight. Another course uh, we will have uh, uh, the further discussion and then present to the board. So I want to thank Dr. Bodhi and uh, her team. It's very wonderful uh, discussions and uh, that those new courses will provide our students uh, a lot of opportunity to prepare them for their future. And uh, I want to thank Dr. Bowley and her team. And Monday, uh, Monday this Monday, three, three days ago, I went to uh, Kenneth Armour's uh, funeral. Ken was elected Board of Education of East uh, Peace Gateway at the age of 19. And he served uh, as board member for 11 years. It's very unfortunate he passed away at the age of 46. I'm very sorry for this big loss for Ken, uh, for the community. That's all Thank I have. Thank you, Libra. That was, that was very well said. Anybody else? Susanna and then Heather? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to let everyone know Human Relations Council will be um, hosting another um, online event, Facebook Live on April 20th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, the topic of this one is Building Bridges, Combating Anti-Asian Racism uh, in light of the um, you know, uptick in, in violence against Asians. Uh, it's a it's a very um, educational panel uh, oriented towards you know understanding uh, the issues and um, really building bridges is the theme. So you know how we work together to you know better understand each other and and understand uh, the challenges that we we each uh, face. Uh, so uh, again, what was the date again, Susanna? April twentieth at seven thirty p.m. And we could join um, Facebook Live, Facebook Live, and uh, it it does get recorded, so it could be viewed afterwards. But it's always great to have the live engagement, and you know we can try to field some questions uh, from from the audience uh, when it's live. And we'll be engaging. We're working on engaging youth in this with uh, the um, East Brunswick High School Asian Club. So that's still working. Great. Hard. Um, great. Yeah. Very important, timely topic. Thank you. Heather, I, I think I saw your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to thank the administrative team. Um, I had seen that following the attacks in um, Atlanta, that the district did post resources for families and for the community. Um, I also just wanted to say, I recently noticed it changed and the, the links are not what they were when it first went up. And I think it's a valuable resource for the community and for our students. Um, for parents that are looking. Thank you. We, we will make sure that gets corrected. Okay, anybody else have anything? Okay, seeing none, we do have a need for closed session. The Board of Education must discuss matters which are not appropriate for discussion in a public meeting. And whereas the Board of Education intends to discuss matters as follows, those items in tonight's agenda. The length of closed session is estimated to be one hour after which public meeting of the board shall reconvene and action will not be taken. Can I please have a motion to go into closed session? So moved, Jeff. Moved by Jeff, second by Lori. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstain? Motion carries. Thank you. Good night, board members. Please remember to leave this meeting and log into the closed session. Those watching tonight, stay safe. <laughs>